Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is a review of the 1999 science fiction comedy, Galaxy Quest. This is one of my all-time favorite science fiction comedies. I wouldn't say it's quite on the same level as Spaceballs. I think that's a funnier film. But this is still a really enjoyable, entertaining, and funny film in its own right. I grew up watching this film. I watched it countless times on VHS. I watched it so much on VHS that the tape actually got eaten by the VCR. And I remember my stepdad finding a way to fix it so I could continue to watch it. That's how often I revisited and watched this particular film growing up. And as an adult, it's even funnier because I catch more of the callbacks. I catch more of the in-jokes. I understand more of the satire. And I really see it for the revolutionary, ahead-of-its-time film that it is. Before Galaxy Quest, there really weren't that many meta films of this type. There really also were not that many movies that homaged the genre or a particular type of film or television series like Star Trek in a way that was respectful to not only the property itself, but to the fans. This film also does a really cool thing by incorporating the fans themselves into the plot and making them just as important as the other crew members or the other characters in the movie in terms of their involvement in the finale. And I think that's just such a really inspired idea. And it makes the film really stand out. And it also helps the movie continue to be so enjoyable watch after watch because as an audience member you feel like you are actually a part of it. It's directed by Dean Parasot and before this he just did a film called Home Fries but he was a director that was well known enough by one of the producers that they decided to give him a shot and I think it was a really great choice. It wasn't the first choice. Their first choice is actually Harold Ramis. Harold Ramis signed on to the project and he was going to do it, but there were some creative differences. Tim Allen was cast as uh, Nesmith and Harold was afraid that he would handle him the same way that he did Robin Williams in Club Paradise, which wound up being a critical and financial failure. So he was scared that he wouldn't be able to capture Tim Allen's particular comedic genius or, or his talents on screen properly. So he dropped out. Harold did see the film and ultimately he thought it was a really good movie and he thought Tim Allen did a wonderful job. But at the time, he was worried about how he was going to handle him. And that's why he stepped down. Also, he didn't get his initial casting choice. He wanted Kevin Klein, but Kevin Klein uh, declined. He also was considering Alec Baldwin. Uh, but for some reason or another, Alec Baldwin was not cast. I think uh, he wanted to do it, but DreamWorks were not really that big on him as the lead for this film because they thought this was going to be a big movie. They thought this was going to be a big hit, which is why they even went as far to try to cast Bruce Willis as Nesmith. And uh, thankfully that fell through. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine Bruce Willis in the Tim Allen role in this movie? I just can't. I'm sorry. Tim Robbins was also another name that was considered, but I, uh, Ultimately, they went with Tim Allen, and Dean Parasot was brought on board to direct. And Dean had this really great way of getting all of his crew and his cast on board 
with the project, making them feel comfortable, making them feel relaxed, and also allowing them to experiment. He chose to have the set be so relaxed, and as a result, he was willing to shoot sequences and shoot other takes and, and to also incorporate the actor's ideas into the film. Not all of them made it in. Not all of them worked. But some of them did. And some of them were genuinely brilliant in their own right. And as a result, it really made the cast feel like they were at home. So Dean did a great job creating the right atmosphere for this film. But he also did a great job capturing the vibe and the overall spirit and the tone of the movie. He understood that this was meant to be a tribute, a homage, a uh, tongue-in-cheek pay of respects to Star Trek and its fans. Not a mean-spirited parody. And he also understood that in order to make this work as well as it ultimately wound up working, he needed to play it seriously. So, he managed, he managed to actually get that across to his cast and have them play it straight. And as a result, the film is so much funnier. If the movie was more akin to what Ramis had in mind, which is goofier and sillier and more over the top, I think it still would have had its moments of, of hilarity, but I don't think it really would have the same really biting bits of satire. I don't think some of the film's most hilarious scenes with its sardonic wit at times would be as funny if it was so silly and over the top. So, in that regard, I think Dean was, a, was the perfect choice to direct. He knew what Galaxy Quest was trying to go for, and he also enhanced what uh, the writers were trying to do by adding his own input into the film. And he knew what would fit and what wouldn't. He also knew how to shoot a lot of other sequences and work so well with the cinematographer and create a lot of really impressive designs and... Uh, not necessarily designs, but he knew how to create a lot of impressive shots. It was his idea to have different aspect ratios throughout the film. And uh, it's a very visually impressive film at times. And in large part, that's due to DreamWorks' faith in the movie by getting the top of the line people in the industry involved with the film in terms of its effects and its visuals. You got Industrial Light and Magic, you got Stan Winston Studio, who worked on the makeup effects. But it's also, you have a director who has an eye for visuals. He knows how to make things pop. He knows how to shoot sequences that need to have a certain amount of energy and power to them. And I, I've always felt that Dean did a really good job directing the film in terms of the sequences that needed to provide some thrills, but also the sequences that needed to provide some spills and comedy. I feel he balanced both the action, the sci-fi wonder, and the comedy very well. That's what makes his effort in something like Bill and Ted Face the Music so disappointing, because you've seen what he can do with this kind of genre. He can knock it out of the park, like he did with this film. So it, it was really disappointing to see such a lackluster film in terms of the directing with that movie. But that's not the case of this film. This is, I would probably say, his best film in terms of his direction. But as good as Dean's direction is, the film wouldn't be nearly as successful without its screenplay, which is incredibly witty, funny, heartfelt, charming, and really original and it featured a great idea of what if you take a crew from a fictional science fiction television show like star trek and you put them in a scenario where they are actually in outer space and they are actually in a space battle in a spaceship and they're fighting aliens it's a really inspired concept has a lot of comedic potential and it also has a really 
nice pull, a really good uh, way to grab the audience's interest. And the way that it's set up is really well done. They start out by introducing these characters, these actors who play these roles on this popular TV show, Galaxy Quest, and they're doing the convention circuit, and a lot of them are miserable, a lot of them are tired of it, but, you know, Peter Nesmith, the star, you know, he's he's so happy and he's gung-ho, you know, like you're Jason Nesmith, actually. Um, the, uh, the character is Peter Taggart. So I, I got I get the two mixed up. But you have Jason Nesmith, you know, Peter Taggart, your commander is here. You know, he's super into it. But similar to William Shatner, according to stories by fans, he was at the point where he was disillusioned. He was bitter. And that carried over a lot of his interactions with the fans. And I love how the film pulls away the curtain and shows these actors in a vulnerable state early on in the film so they have a point from where they can grow as characters and as people it also enables tim allen to really flex his acting muscles to play a guy like uh, jason who is sick of it all and he overhears some trolls in a bathroom talk about how much of a joke he is and that affects him and he drinks and you know he gets completely plastered and starts losing faith in and who he is and and his place on this earth and then the thermians come and they give him a, a reason to care and a reason to live again and then he brings his cast on, on board he brings what used to be his friends along on this adventure and initially it starts off very rocky but then they strengthen their relationship and their resolve throughout the film and i feel that the screenplay does a really great job incorporating all these different bits of character development for these characters as well as the humor i mean the sequence when i mean this screenplay the which was essentially a collaborative effort by David Howard and Robert Gordon. Robert Gordon wrote most of the script. David Howard wrote the original spec script, which was called, I think it was called Captain Starshine. And some of the concepts that were in the spec script ultimately wound up in the finished film, like the hilarious sequence when Laredo is taking the protector out of the space hangar for the first time, and it drifts to the side and then it just starts scraping against the side of the hangar. That was something that was originally written by uh, David Howard, but was then put in, uh, back into the script uh, for Galaxy Quest by uh, Robert Gordon. And I'm really glad they kept that, because that, that is one of the funniest scenes in the film. But there's a lot of other really just nice bits of satire of Star Trek. You could tell that the people who wrote this had a genuine passion and a love for Star Trek and for these kind of stories. And that really showcased uh, a lot of the film's biggest strengths in terms of its story and the screenplay. Because when you have passion for something, it helps so much. It helps you care enough that you handle the jokes and you handle the storylines properly. You don't half-ass things. You pay a lot of respect to what you love and and i feel that galaxy quest is definitely one of those films in a lot of ways it's a better star trek movie than any of the jj abrams star trek films it's the last great star trek film or star trek anything and it's not even a star trek movie so you know that that's something that i think really shows how much passion there was in this script from these uh fans of star trek the, how they incorporate Justin Long's character and his nerdy friends into the climax and how they are the ones that ultimately provide the assistance that uh, Jason and Tawny need to be able to get through the ridiculous obstacle course to shut off the core 
to prevent it from exploding. I mean, it's just a really inspired idea and it's handled very well and respectfully. And just the interactions and, and, and the uh, banter between the cast members here is just hilarious. Anytime that Alan Rickman is reacting to things with his just unbelievably impressive deadpan is a laugh riot and you got guys like tony shalhoub who plays uh the essentially was like a science commander or something like that yeah he plays fred kwan the tech sergeant and he doesn't have that big of a role, but he does such a good job with improvisation and physical acting that he still leaves his mark. I love the stuff where he's on the he's on the uh, shuttle as it's going to this planet, and it's a rough and bumpy ride, and he's smiling and he's like eating like cheese and crackers. It's it's just hilarious, and how he reacts. When uh, they teleport the Gridnack and uh, it turned inside out and it explodes, it, it's just that that whole sequence is hilarious. It uh, turned inside out and it exploded. It what? <laughs> um, but there's also a sense of reality to things, despite the fact that it's full of over-the-top stuff like rock monsters and cute aliens who then bear their sharp teeth and aren't so cute anymore and the thermians who are silly and over the top and speaking in weird languages and a weird tone of voice and of course the absurd idea of, of this science fiction TV show crew winding up in an actual space battle. There are moments of reality that really do leave their mark. Like when Jason has to tell uh, the leader of the Thermians that he lied. And that's a really great scene. And it's really poignant. And it features some really good acting by Tim Allen. And a lot of that is due to the script. I mean, the screenwriter did a really wonderful job capturing those kind of moments in the film. That's what makes the moments that are real crowd pleasers, like the finale when uh, the protector carries mines behind it and blows up Saris's ship, or when uh, they're, they had to detach from... Uh, the, Essentially, it was a, like a saucer thing, you know, where they had to detach from the rest of the ship. And the the front of the ship crashes through a convention hall. And there's this really grand and amazing moment when uh, the crew of the Protector actually shows up for real in an actual spaceship at the convention hall. And they take out Ceres once and for all, and they think that, and the people in the audience, they cheer and they clap and they think it's just part of the show, but in reality, they actually were on a spaceship, and that was a space alien, and they saved the day, for real, in front of all the fans. It was a nice treat for the fans, and uh, it's a great way to end the movie. I just, I just feel it's a really great script from the character development to the jokes to the overall concept to how things play out despite its PG rating, which initially was not the intent. Uh, the original cut of the film was closer to PG-13. DreamWorks wanted a PG film because they saw the success of Rugrats the movie and wanted to emulate that, so they forced Galaxy Quest to be the kids' film for their docket, for their schedule, and uh, that's why it's PG. That's why you have scenes where Sigourney Weaver, when she's reacting to the ridiculous obstacle course, and she's all like, well, screw that! Well, you can clearly see that she's dubbed, and it's a bad dub at that. You can clearly see that she says, well, fuck that! And um, that's because that was cut out to make it PG. But despite its PG rating, it still has an edge to it. 
it doesn't feel like it doesn't have any teeth. So um, I think the only thing that it really lost was maybe some more dirty jokes or or swearing. And, and I would love to see that version of the film, but I, I feel that that isn't something that really holds the film back that much. But uh, yeah, I just I think it's just a really impressive and really original and inventive screenplay. And uh, as good as the script is, though, it would not be nearly as memorable or as funny without the perfect cast and Tim Allen in what is arguably his best acting role to date as uh, Jason Nesmith, Sigourney Weaver, who you could clearly tell was having a blast playing this character of Tawny Madison, uh, Gwen DeMarco, who's just tired of being typecast as this woman with big tits and blonde hair but uh it was something that sigourney really loved playing because it was so different than what she uh, was known for the kind of roles that she would do normally alan rickman inspired brilliant bit of casting and it's one of his finest roles because he's put in this fish out of water scenario he's forced to act outside his comfort zone and as a result because he's such an established actor and he's such a professional his approach of just taking things so seriously but still having fun with things is absolutely brilliant and i just love this character i love alan rickman's performance in this and he is definitely missed i miss him so much uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, he made that scene that could have just been completely silly and dumb where they play it straight, where Lazarus says the the line that he didn't want to say throughout the movie because he was tired of it. But at that one moment, he says that line, and it's genuinely powerful. It gives you chills. And that big part of that is because of Alan Rickman's ability as an actor. You got Tony Shalhoub, who's a very talented uh, comedic actor in his own right. You got Sam Rockwell, who almost steals the movie as Guy, crewman number six, who's just constantly paranoid throughout the movie because he's a, one of those red shirt type characters who dies in the episode that he's in. Daryl Mitchell, he's fine too as Tommy. I would say out of the cast, he's probably the weakest one. But then again, he's not really given a whole lot to do compared to the other cast members. But he does have his moments. I mean, the way that he reacts to some of the more insane moments in the movie is hilarious. Uh, like how he reacts to when they go through the minefield the first time. <laughs> that always gets me. Yeah, but Enrico uh, Colantoni is Mafazar. Uh, Missy Pyle as Lalari, Justin Long in his first role on film as Brandon, this dedicated fan of Galaxy Quest. Um, you also have Rain Wilson, uh, who plays a Thermian in the film, uh, which was his uh, film debut as well. Patrick Breen, who plays Quelec. So, as well as the, the actor who plays Aceris, uh, Robin Sachs. Who plays the the general who leads the reptilian humanoids who want to destroy the Thermians? I want to give him a lot of credit. He deserves way more credit than he gets when it comes to the cast for this film because he acted under pounds and pounds of latex and practical makeup, and he was intimidating as hell. Uh, he had a really strong presence. And I, I thought he was a great villain. He was the type of villain that didn't have that much depth, but it worked because of his presence. He was intimidating. He was blunt. He was someone you did not want to mess with. And I feel that uh, Robin Sachs really exemplified that intensity that the character needed so well. So yeah, great cast. Great score, too, by David Newman. One of my favorite scores by him. The main theme for this film is iconic. It's every bit as iconic as any of the music by Jerry Goldsmith for the Star Trek film series. 
in a lot of ways, it's the heart and soul of the film. A lot of these sequences are amplified in terms of their effectiveness because of David Newman's score. And some great effects by Industrial Light and Magic. The look of the protector, uh, the sequence when uh, Jason, he first sees space because he's uh, covered in like this liquid that enables him to teleport back to Earth and the doors open up and it's just a gorgeous shot of, of space. I love it. Or the look of uh, the time travel uh, uh, ex machina kind of device that was used in the film's plot. Uh, the uh, Omega-13 and uh, practical makeup effects. The effects on the, the Thermians when they don't have their humanoid disguises and there are these alien octopuses uh the look of Ceres and and his men in particular the look of Ceres and his men uh i i love that design it's so lifelike it looks so good and also the aliens too like these little guys some good cgi for the time and uh overall just a really impressive film visually in terms of its effects and the editing by Don Zimmerman, who is a veteran and he really knows his stuff. And he worked a lot with the, with the director. They had a shared vision for the film. And that really did uh, show throughout the movie as well. There's a lot of times where you have a director and an editor who kind of don't see eye to eye. But that's not the case of this film. And that really does help the movie flow as well as it does it has a great pace to it 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 is it really isn't that boring uh running time of 102 minutes but it never really feels like it drags at any point also features some really gorgeous and and beautiful bits of cinematography by uh jerry zelinsky uh the shots that were shot on location on, on a, uh, I think it was like a desert or something like that, a desert canyon landscape. I thought those were really well shot and, and well put together. And his style and his look paired seamlessly with uh, what Dean Parasot was doing with his direction, with his camera angles, with his uh, shot selection, with what he was deciding to add to the film. The movie didn't make a ton of money in the box office. It, it made a little bit of a profit on a $45 million budget and only made $90 million. So it wasn't like a massive big hit. But it got a huge cult following over the years. And I think it 100% deserves it. I love Galaxy Quest. I've always loved Galaxy Quest. And... I would have loved to have seen the TV show that they were going to do, but uh, that didn't come to pass because Alan Rickman passed away. And I really appreciate the fact that the people behind that show put it on the shelf out of respect to Alan. And they understood it wouldn't be the same without him. And I thought that was a really touching gesture from the people involved with the TV show because everybody, every single cast member had signed on. But... Uh, Alan passed away and they decided no we don't want to we don't want to do it without him and uh yeah I just I just really love this film it's a great movie it's a lot of fun it's hilarious it's creative it's very imaginative it's got a great cast and great performances um this Blu-ray is pretty decent. It's got some nice little features here and there. Deleted scenes, some featurettes. I would love to see this get remastered in 4K and also include the documentary Never Surrender, uh, a Galaxy Quest documentary, which is done by Screen Junkies. Also, if you haven't seen that documentary, check it out as soon as possible. Because if you're a fan of this film, that is a love letter to not only the fans of this movie, but a love letter to the film itself. A lot of interviews with various different cast members and members of the crew. Really informative, really entertaining. Uh, one of the better documentaries of its type that I've seen. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching my review of Galaxy Quest. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya. Oh, and remember, 
never give up, never surrender.